How about I join the masses like any other Sonic fanboy out there and just spread the hate? Yeah, Sonic Unleash is bad and good. I mean, it's really bad and good. Sonic 06 is not our fault. It was all Sega's, I swear. Now, if you'll excuse me again, I need to dress up like Sonic and head out to my favorite convention to go and hit on some people. Bye! <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to try my hand at this top 10 thing one more time. So, let's get right into this. Ah yes, we all love them, we all hate them, and sometimes we just downright love to hate them. I'm talking about video game bosses, of course. You know those kinds of enemies or distinctive challenges that limit our progression until a certain criteria has been met? Hey, looky there, I actually made a coherent sentence for once. Anyway, video games without bosses is like playing Mario without having the ability to jump. It's like cooking a hot pocket only to come out of the microwave still cold somehow. And to this very day, I still think it's those damn pesky hot pocket fairies still getting my food! Most importantly, of course, it's like having Shadow the Edgehog without the edge! He's so fucking edgy! Yeah, that is how messed up it would be. Now, I know some games don't have bosses, but that doesn't really matter here, now does it? So, without further ado, I should probably get into talking about what I consider my top 10 bosses in video games. Keep in mind that there are exceptions to what I consider a boss. A boss that makes it on this list can either be a boss that has an amazing fight, maybe great buildup, or just really unique in other aspects. Also keep in mind this is my list, so it is my opinion and more than likely will be subject to change. So let's get this show on the road, shall we? Number 10. Oh, Lazarevich. Words cannot describe a man like this who is just so hell-bent on blood, getting what he desires, being bald, and overall just a hell of a guy to hang out with. Of course he's only fun when he's not mercilessly killing his own men. You better think twice about ever telling him no. Actually, you won't even get a second chance to even make a mistake in the first place. SpongeBob, did you get those bathrooms mopped yet? Yes, ma'am. I mean, sir. I mean, boss. I mean, Pooba. His main plan of action was to get our hero, Nathan Drake, to help him discover Shambhala. Of course, Lazarevich's plan falls when his men are attacked by giant mutant apes who only want one thing. Your head and a nice vacation to Hawaii. Well, okay, that's two things, but that's not the point. Lazarevich is scary, and I believe that's what made him so interesting. He didn't care who lived or died. Well, as long as your name didn't start with Nathan and ended with Drake, and your middle name was probably something like Danger. But anyway, like I mentioned before, he will kill to get his way, even if it was his own men. Now the reason I put Lazarevich so high up on this list was due to the fact that I didn't really enjoy his boss fight all that much. Yes, compared to other boss fights in this series, I thought his was a more complete, I would say. It's just that you didn't shoot at him to kill him. No, you had to shoot the sap on the trees to inflict any kind of damage. It's a cool idea, yeah, don't get me wrong, but I still think the main build-up through the entire game is what made Lazarevich a must on this list of mine. Number 9. I'm sure that we all remember those good old days when we used to play some great Nintendo titles on our Nintendo 64s. We had Super Mario 64, we had Mario Kart 64, we even had Mario, uh, Fox 64. Nonetheless, everybody and their grandmothers had Paper Mario. Yes, I am talking about THE Paper Mario, not Paper Mario the Old Door, not Super Paper Mario Bros, or Paper Mario Let's Stick Things. No, I'm strictly talking about the original Cardboard Mario. But more importantly, a boss from that said game. There were many bosses in the Plastic Mario franchise, but there was always one in the original Trash Bag Mario that stood out to me the most. No, not Tubba Blubba, I'm talking of course about Huff and Puff. <laughs> Who do you think I was going to say in the first place, a Crystal King? I mean, come on, really? Like seriously guys, come on, seriously, his, his level was pretty much trash. I'm talking about the Crystal King, it was just utter, just disgusting. Just, just like Sticky Note Mario. Okay, okay, fine, I'm just kidding, guys. Sticky Note Mario is the best, it is Bay. But unlike the previous entry, I would say I did enjoy the fight somewhat. By enjoying it, I specifically mean the idea of the fight in question. Huff and Puff is kinda hard, but granted he does look cool and his theme is kicking, and also I did enjoy the level itself. Well, I enjoyed the entire first game in general, but 
I think instead of just sitting here gushing about it, I should probably talk about the boss. Well, what is there really to say besides what I've said already? See, the thing is, he's fun, but he's challenging. He's a cool concept and a really good design. He was just one of those weird kind of bosses I like from the Paid Mario series. Now, if you excuse me, I need to go and pre-order Watercolor Mario. P.S. Fuck you guys, I actually think the game looks good. Sticker Star is supposed to go fuck yourselves, you fucking pizza of shit. Number 8. I'm gonna go ahead and admit that with this next boss on my list, I have a small bias towards the game. Just a little bit. Now, I'm sure everyone's gonna yell at me and say, why is Atlas not number 8? Or hell, what about Ryan? Or even Dr. Steinman? Well, let's just say I love those bosses in their own right. It's just that Standard Cohen stood out to me the most. Ah, yes. It's like the first time when I played the game and I heard that sweet, sexy, mesmerizing voice of his. He called me his little moth, and right after that, he swept me right off my feet. He told me to go and take care of his little princesses. Now to be really honest, the cool part about each one of the apprentices is they add their own little fun way of killing them. And you know what happens after you kill them all? You eventually go and see the man behind the radio himself right up there in his room. <clears throat> I mean, okay, hold on, let's, let's not make this into a fanfiction, shall we? Believe me, folks, after you meet Sander Cohen in his own little room up there in Fort Frolic, he's just as crazy as he was before you met him. And you know what? That's what makes Cohen so unique. Oh, and he's also kind of optional too, so you really don't have to fight him if you didn't want to. You either kill him in Fort Frolic or you head over to his apartment in Olympus Heights. Now, once again, like I said, he's totally optional, but if you decide to go on the route of actually killing him in Fort Frolic, you're going to lose out on even more stuff than you would have if you went to his apartment. Because if you went to his apartment and you kill him there, you get a Power to the People station, so it's all not that bad. Or you just don't kill him at all and let the pesky little butterfly go. But just like Lazarvich to me, Cohen's fight itself wasn't really so enthralling. Now I'm going to specifically blame the developers for this, but I think the reasoning why his fight wasn't so good was because he actually was mainly just a Houdini splicer anyway. If he had a better fight and would have kept his overall personality, I would have put him even higher on this list. Alright, little moss, fly away, and we're on to the next boss, so get out of here. Go! Shoot! Get the fuck out of here. Next boss. Let's go! The Wild Bunny by Sander Cohen. I want to take the ears off, but I can't. I hop, and when I hop, I never get off the ground. It's my curse, my eternal curse. I want to take the ears off, but I can't. It's my curse, it's my fucking curse. I want to take the ears off, please. Take them off! Please! <laughs> Number 7 Fear the old blood is what the old Master Willem once said, and boy was he right. Bloodborne turned out to be one of the best games I have ever experienced in a long time. Now let me say that again, it was one hell of an experience. It made me laugh, it made me cry, and it downright frustrated me to the very core. I will be honest, I have never actually been a true fan of the Souls series until I decided to take that risk and get a copy of Bloodborne back in early 2015. And to my surprise, it quickly became a close favorite of mine close to Bioshock. Also with a great game like this, and more importantly the lineup of bosses the Souls series itself has, Bloodborne without a doubt has some amazing ass bosses. Now the one main boss I'm going to be talking about is actually an optional final boss, and yes, you did hear me right, the man sitting in his wheelchair throughout the Hunter's Dream gives an option near the end of the game to be either reawoken and see morning again, or we can simply refuse our fate and take on the man himself. The man that was once a great hunter and the first of the hunters, who is also now trapped in this dream thanks to the moon presence, goes by the name of German. He is a hunter just like us, but instead he boasts a large scythe and is no mere man to mess around with. Trust me on this one folks, he will take you down to the ground if you even mess up once. He also has himself a nice big shotgun that when he equips some bone marrow ash, he can do instant interrupts on command. Now he may be powerful, but he also can be kind of easy if you know how to utilize your interruptions correctly. This video is not a showcase on how to beat bosses, so it wouldn't be very appropriate of me just to spout out tips here. Instead, I'm going to leave you with this. Never judge a book by its cover, because one day, you may or may not meet someone like German who looks like he is helpless. But give him a reason to fight, and he will show you what for. Number 6 God of War is a classic amongst my family. It has always been that tried and true staple that has kept us coming back for more. Of course, some of the games in this franchise I don't particularly like, but regardless, they all have their moments. 
And one of the best moments of growing up was playing the original God of War. It was an interesting time for me. It was a time when I discovered games that were just like Devil May Cry. I had finally discovered what a hack and slash title actually was. After that, I became a fan of the genre. And like many other fans, I enjoyed the original in all of its entirety. Of course, just like before, there was that one boss that stuck to me the most. And after doing some research, I found out it actually had a name after all these years. Yes folks, my number 6 spot goes to Pandora's Guardian. The Guardian was a massive minotaur who had an amazing opening, amazing soundtrack playing in the background, and needless to say, a fun fight. Of course, you can cheese it, but to some, that will only spoil the fun. Not for me, of course. To hell with it, I say. Let's run through the halls of ancient Greece and slay some demons. <laughs> The boss itself is pretty simple, and also has a simple idea of how to kill it. You simply slash it for a bit, ride it like a bull, and then shoot it right in the kisser till you break all of its armor off. Now once said armor is off, you shoot it down one more time and make him a staple on the door for all to remember what this monster once was. Nevertheless, a great boss for a great title who I think still holds up even to this day. Greetings, I'm Space Ghost. Sonic 06 is not our fault. It was all Sega's, I swear. You can't swear! Only the super edgy 1985 Crimson Chin can swear! Yeah! And I got cancelled for it! Number 5. Now I'm going to be straight honest with you folks on this one. I never played either of the Dark Seeds. I've watched playthroughs and that's about it, and if I had to say, I'd say the second one probably would be my favorite. I have a weird sense of interest when it comes to the abnormal, as we would say. And thanks to Adrar Geiger, may he rest in peace, his artwork struck me in awe and complete fascination with Dark Seed 2. Now the next person on my list isn't so much of a boss, instead he's more of, as we say, an antagonist. In Dark Seed 2, you play the role of Mike Dawson who is totally a down-to-earth kind of guy, and he also has his cool yet totally not Fonz friend named Jack. Yes, we all know where I'm going with this. Jack is up next, folks. And it turns out that later through the game, you start to discover that this man who you thought was your friend actually turned out to be your Dark World counterpart. He was a creature that could shapeshift, and he took the form of Fonz. Believe me, I wouldn't have gone with the Fonz look. I actually probably would have wanted something more like Steve Urkel. Did I do that? <laughs> That's just me, of course. Maybe Jack was tied on a budget, and the only thing he could actually get was the Fonz. Hey, I'm not gonna judge. Whatever works for you, buddy. Hey, you ought to give the man some credit though, he did a good job of making even Mike himself look like an idiot. Wait, I think Mike did that himself. Never mind, let's just move on to the next boss, shall we? Number 4 Since I have been honest with you guys lately, I'm going to say this. Yes, I was one of those guys who said that Kingdom Hearts was dumb. I said it looked like utter shit because it had Disney icons in it. After getting my hands on the remix copies in the past few years, it is safe for me to say that I was wrong and I do apologize for it. Okay, am I forgiven now? Good. Now let's talk about some bosses. If you didn't know already, or have been living under a rock, Kingdom Hearts is a well-known franchise. The original was a classic amongst kids and teens around my age at the time. Kingdom Hearts 2 improved on gameplay, but kind of took away from the platforming just a bit just to improve on that. When the games were first releasing, I can only imagine how confusing the plot was probably getting. But after 14 years, we almost have a vague grasp of what the hell was going on. Most of the plot does in some way, shape, or form have something to do with the Organization 13 itself. Now what the organization was, was a group of nobodies whose only purpose in life was to make Sora's life a living nightmare. But the best part about the members themselves is each one is unique. Now you do get to fight at least all the members in the second game, but the original creation came with the game called Chain of Memories. I would much rather keep away from talking about this game too much, but I will say this. Most of them, as far as I'm concerned, have actually died in Chain of Memories. And in the second game, you get to fight their absent silhouettes. Most of the members don't really stick out to me as much as, say, one in particular. And his name is Axel. That's A-X-E-L. Got that memorized? Oh, I hate that fucking line so damn much, I just want to throw a punch him through my TV every time he says it. Hey, Alex. Got it memorized? Don't fuck yourself, Axel. Zimnus was also a favorite of mine due to the fact that I thought the final battle with him was actually pretty cool. Yes, it turned into an anime near the end, but who cares? I thought it was still fun. Larxene played a main role alongside Marluxia, of course, in Chain of Memories as an antagonist, but I did not like the fight itself, but I do like her. 
She was just too damn fast for my blood. And Vexen? No, fuck him. If I was to talk about each member, I'd be here all day. Let's just say I personally like Larxene, Zimnus, Axel, and Marluxia the best. The rest of you folks can decide who you like, and I'm going to see you in the next boss. Number 3 Oh boy, the ever so present, menacing, evil, handsome robotic genius just had to be on this list. I am talking of course about Dr. Nefarious. I mean come on, with a name like that it just screams evil. He probably graduated evil school alongside Dr. Cortex. But unlike Cortex, Nefarious is funny. When I say funny I mean he is hilarious. The first two Ratchet games I found were fun at best. But they never really hit that funny bone of mine. Not until Up Your Arsenal of course. The third installment let us meet the maniacal maniac himself. Granted, he had a few lines that were funny here, but the fellows over at Insomniac really used him to his full potential and crack of time. And my god was he funny. Here, just take a look. <laughs> and then I said, not so smart now, are you? You get it? Because he's a moron! Oh, Dr. Nefarious, you have such a wonderful sense of humor. And you're so, so... Uh -oh. See, that's only just a snippet of what made him good. His overall fight I can't really say was too fun. Well, bosses in the Ratchet franchise never really hit it home for me much anyway, but granted Nefarious' boss fights were particularly the same in the two games anyway, so what's it really matter? And I actually haven't gotten around to playing the new installment, so I don't really know if you find him there or not. But man, wasn't that movie just good though? Like, holy crap it was good. Now if only we can get ourselves a Kingdom Hearts movie as- wait, hold on, we did, didn't we? Oh, that's right, twice I might add. Well, either way, Nefarious' personality and his butler will make up for some of the Ratchet games I don't like, so let's go ahead and head on to the next boss. Number 2 Like many other people out there, I would say I was pretty psyched about the new Silent Hill PT. It was an amazing way to show off what a true horror game would be like. Well, at least we still have the old ones. By that, I mean the first three. I never got around to playing the first game, and it might be pretty clear by now that I actually loved Heather from the third game. But there was something in the second game that was lurking in those dark apartments. Something eerie. Something ominous. Something really- OH MY GOD! WHAT IN THE LIVING- WHAT THE FUCK IS THAT?! Ladies and gentlemen, meet Pyramid Head. Also known as Red Pyramid, which, let it be known, is a stupid name. He's a semi-boss-ish monster in Silent Hill 2. He does make a reappearance in Homecoming, but he isn't really much of a threat there as he is in this game. In fact, Pyramid Head is actually a manifestation of James's twisted mind. Now I understand that Silent Hill is a more of a psychological thriller game, but I still need to know one thing. What in the living ass fuckery is under that helmet of his? Why is something so human-like, like him, capable of carrying it? And his chin, is, is it huge or something? By my mother's mandible, I say nay! It's the crimson chin! All he does is spawn more questions and answers. Also, he spawns another pyramid head. My fucking god, it's like they just come out of the damn woodwork over here. Either way, you only truly fight him once, and both pyramid heads end up killing themselves anyway. So it's not like you actually kill them yourself. Still, pyramid head is one badass scary son of a bitch. There, I rest my case. Number one. Here it is folks, it's my number one boss on my list and it can only possibly be the one very person who's totally not overrated by any means at any matter at all or whatever. More words I can't throw into this script, it's Stephen Armstrong. Yep, he's the man with the nano machines, and he's the man who wanted to be a professional basketball player. He's the man with the plan all right. Near the end of Metal Gear Rising, we discovered that Senator Armstrong was planning on using war as a way to be elected president. After he was to be elected, he would use his new business to end war itself. He said every person in his new America would be able to fight in their own wars. I give him props to wanting to end war itself, but alas, he only wanted it to go on as well as means to make a profit. Yeah, it's kind of a twisted way of evil pretty much. At the beginning of his fight, you face off against a Metal Gear named Excelsius. Now this fight itself was fun, and just like every other boss fight in this game, it had an amazing fight theme. After taking down the Metal Gear, you end up having to fight him twice on top of the dead machine itself. After he becomes nearly invincible with those nanomachines running through his body, you then proceed to take him on at ground level. This is where the fight really becomes amazing, and I'm sorry folks, I have to say this, but it just has to be this way. 
The deal with this particular fight is Armstrong is boasting double the life bar of any other boss we've encountered thus far. Also, he has the ability to regenerate his health as well. Now, granted, taking out his healing factor isn't too difficult, but it's still something to be very careful of. One of the coolest things in this fight, of course besides the music piece playing, is that you are using the very sword that Sam wielded to take this son of a bitch down. They've literally gone full anime over here. Come on, Ryan, you can't lose your way. It just has to be this way. Wait, I already made that joke. Ah, damn it. Ah, uh, no matter what, I am without a doubt that Platinum Games took a lot of consideration and effort into making an amazing game just like Metal Gear Rising. I am totally waiting for a sequel. Alas, if we don't get one, I'll be fine with this title alone. It has amazing music, gameplay, and of course, without a doubt, bosses. Hey there everybody, this is Alex here, also known as TurdMonkey1497. I sure as hell hope you all enjoyed that top 10 I just made. That actually took quite a little bit of decent amount of effort to to poop that out of here. This is going to be a live little session right here, so if I fuck up anything or whatever, it's it's totally on me. Well, I did try to record this earlier, but then I even screwed that up too, so I want to get into explaining some things. I This took me uh, probably about like maybe a couple of weeks to make at least, so at least give me some credit. And the thing is with credit, I have to admit that I did take some other people's videos on YouTube, but of course, you know, every other YouTuber I've seen out there has done the same damn thing before. It's called being lazy, folks. That's what it's called. Or not having that game or, oh hell, even that TV show to do anything with it anyway. So, most of the gameplays I took were actually mine from my own Let's Play channel, which of course, you know, you can go check out my Let's Plays and my own channel if you feel like that. Or you can go see my other stupid ass top tens that I made. And, like I said, you know, it took me a couple weeks to make, so at least give it a like or something or a comment or Tell me what you think about it, and of course, this was, you know, purely my opinion, no matter what. <laughs> More than likely, it'll probably change later on in the future. I might change up some bosses here and there, but man, this was, this was quite a bitch to take down. Like, the thing is, with this, I actually ended up putting a, just a tad bit more effort into making this top 10 than, like, any other top 10 I've made so far. So, hopefully this time around, people will actually start to enjoy it. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that people are going to enjoy it, but you, you never know, they probably could. Now, I want to get into talking about some things real quick. Uh, somewhere around the screen, I think maybe like on the right side, there should be probably my Bloodborne Let's Play. That's the first part of my Bloodborne Let's Play. And on the left side of my screen, there should be my last top 10, which is top 10 soundtracks of video games or something like that. Which didn't get, sh it got shit for views. Now, in the beginning of the video, that's of this particular video, that's where I actually showed that little clip from. And yeah, I'm just gonna keep on fucking talking, it seems like, because that's what I do best. Well, actually, instead of just talking, I should probably just go ahead and explain what I'll be doing next for Let's Play-wise. If you are interested in my Let's Plays, uh, I'm gonna be doing Kingdom Hearts, the first one, pretty soon, Final Mix. And my next top 10, I have no idea what's gonna be. Or I, I don't even know if I'm gonna do a review or not, or what. My next project, will probably be a while. It usually takes me like a year or so to like think of anything different, so. I sure as hell hope you all enjoyed, and I will see you guys in my next top 10, and like I said, I'm going to see you all there. Take care, everybody. And me! And me! And me! Not me! I got canceled!